Great, thank you, Mitch. Um, so as Mitch mentioned, I just wanted to focus on this, this concept of uh, I2B2 transmart as an index, a data index. So um, not just as a, a data store. Um, next slide. And to do that, I just wanted to highlight, this is kind of the architecture diagram of how we, how we use the uh, MGB Biobank today. Um, and the middle part, most of you will recognize. So you have this kind of I2B2 core, uh, which includes like primarily the PM cell, the ontology cell, the CRC. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, the database with a common data model. Um, and um, we have the I2B2 common data model, but we can also have the OMOP common data model and uh, the CRC can interact with, with, um, with that data uh, uh, using views uh, and uh, work that um, Lori Phillips has done to, to create, make that compatible. Um, and most of the EHR data is then loaded in. So the big part over here, the big silo on the left is like what a lot of people do, right? So they, they load it into the I2B2 or OMOP um, and then you query that. Um, and then, but we also uh, bring in other types of data. Um, and increasingly, this is becoming more common. Uh, data that doesn't really fit into the, like OMOP common data model doesn't really fit into like the, the more traditional coded EHR data. Uh, things like um, red caps we see in the bottom right corner, that's, that's people are more and more doing that. So you have data from, from uh, ECRF forms and uh, clinical trials. Um, on the top, we have a notes repository, which contains all of the notes. Um, and the, the, so going back to the, the red cap, we usually, we actually do an ETL. So we load the data in, we extract it from red cap using APIs and we load it into the, to the I2B2 common data model, which can just take anything. Um, and then same for imaging. So we have, we have a couple of, of, of um, processes that segment the images. Uh, and then create quantitative values around the images that can be used for research. And we, we ETL that in too. And then we also have two different data sources that we use, that we used um, the CRC's uh, uh, functionality to query REST APIs. Uh, and one of those is the notes repository. And so that is like a huge repository of 220 million notes at Mass General Brigham. And the a user can query and search through those notes, like search the text of those notes. Um, and it, it, it interfaced through an API. Uh, and similarly, we have a VCF files. So gen genomic variant data, um, which are, are indexed and, and then they're set behind an API. And so we can query that API uh, as part of a query. So then you can combine a query that has these, these, these data, the data pieces that are in this other repositories along with what's in the I2B2 CDM and in the OMOP CDM. And one last point to make is that um, we also um, derive data. So oftentimes we have the raw data from the EHR and we want to derive data either uh, we, a lot of times it's computable phenotypes, machine learning phenotypes or rules-based phenotypes, um, or even simple things that we want to like do BMI. We want to compute a BMI from a weight and height using a stored procedure. Um, and so we create, you know, we, we read the data from the, from the common data model and then write, the, write it right back. Um, and so that's kind of another approach. Um, so all this together is to say that uh, I2B2 can be used as an index of data that it lives elsewhere um, and in different ways. And this is how we've been using it today. Um, next slide, Mitch, please. Uh, and this is a, a subset of the biobank portals, the COVID biobank portal, which includes patients uh, con uh, that are consented to the MGB biobank and, um, and have, have a COVID test, any COVID test, positive or negative. Uh, and, and, and Mitch showed the ontology before, but this is kind of another point of view. And um, some of the folders, so you'll see there's like the fourth line down is the genomic query by variant, and that's using the, the API for the variants. Um, kind of the second to the bottom is notes and reports, and that's searching through the notes repository. We have healthcare data. That's, that's kind of our bucket for all of the EHR data. We have curated disease populations above that, which is um, derived data for phenotypes, uh, computable phenotypes. Um, 
And so Biobank Health Information Survey is our red cap form that every participant uh, will ask every participant to fill out. So data is, it's, it's totally kind of transparent to users. They don't know where that data lives and they can run queries just as they would any query. Uh, and the data comes back and the numbers come back and you can get distributions of, of demographics um, as you're familiar in I2B2. Uh, okay, next slide. So just summarizing kind of like the kind of the idea as the data index, and that is, uh, while I2B2 was initially focused on EHR and claims data and loading that I2B2 and Transmart, we can load all, all sorts of different data. It's a, so flexible that the, the, the I2B2 CDM is very flexible, uh, as we all know, and the star schema itself can hold any kind of structured and unstructured data. And with the CRC and the uh, API, the I2B2 APIs uh, enable linking to external data sets uh, in real time, and we can host all kinds of data. Um, and a couple of co other concepts is that the, the data, we try to maintain it in the source format with minimal transformations. Uh, and this is super important for provenance because once you transform the data and load it into the CDM, you kind of sometimes lose a little bit of uh, what's happening. And if you make a mistake, that could be problematic. Um, and so the normalization or the harmonization is actually happening on the ontology, which is, is kind of the I2B2 uh, distinguishing factor, right? So there's an ontology that can be anything and people build ontologies all the time. And that is, is what drives all of this, right? So where does the data live? Uh, what is how, how do we group the data? How do we normalize it? And, um, and that's an, in the ontology level. And it's very flexible. Uh, okay, next slide. And then just a little focus on exporting um, that Min Mitch mentioned. So once, once we have the data in the index, we can go and create export files. And the export files can be any kind of format that we define. So um, we've, we've, for a number of years, we've created wide files. So typically when users want to analyze data, they like to see one row per patient and various like, columns uh, along that. And you know that means that you have to aggregate the columns oftentimes, because as we know, a lot of data is longitudinal. And so how we, we define, we, we provide an interface to, to uh, aggregate the columns in different ways. So values could be aggregated by maximum, minimum, uh, the last date, uh, the count of, of, of a concept. And, uh, and that way you can get one row per patient and, and define it different ways. Um, and then there's the more traditional kind of tall file, which is basically like kind of an export of the fact table or, or the dimension tables. Um, but we've done a, a number of variants around that, which is making it a little more compact, um, easier to work with uh, in R and Python. Um, and, and also you can create subsets. So you can drag over a patient set and, um, and export a subset of the fact table that of, for your patients in your query. Um, and that was used um, in the biobank disease ch challenge uh, for, for users to, to work with um, for, for phenotype development. And then lastly, um, you know, the, the, the fact that you're storing pointers to files uh, in the fact table, we can, um, we can pull in the data that lives in raw format and then just package it up and give it to investigators. So that's like device data, images, that kind of thing. Uh, and again, outputs can be a subset based on a patient set. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's kind of a screenshot of, of the what this looks like in the COVID biobank portal. So this is creating a wide file. And for COVID, we, we realized we needed a kind of a stronger temporal uh, component for creating these files. Uh, and so we wanted to, you know, people can run queries and say, you know, people, when, when do you have a COVID when, and when did you take this medication, but you need to kind of constrain those values. And usually your index value is a COVID positive test, for example. And so we just built, uh, we call it the causal, cause, causal analysis workflow. Uh, and the idea is that you constrain values that happen before and after that index date. So you define an index date and then you can constrain the data that you get back uh, from those index dates. And then you can export a CSV file. And then we also had, uh, we connected it to R so that you can, once you have a CSV file, R will read that CSV file and um, create some uh, a, a report, an R markdown report, which has some like basic kind of like table one 
uh, information about your file. So you can quickly look at like, okay, if I have a file that has 20,000 patients, like what does that look like? Um, and that's been super helpful just to like start the analysis, but also for like QA. Next slide. Uh, same kind of concept. This is the tall file in the biobank disease challenge. And then next slide. Um, yeah, same, same thing. All right. And I'll pass it back to, uh, to Sean for, for a wrap up. I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you both, uh, Mitch and Victor, for that excellent summary of what we're looking to do, just to emphasize, not, not done yet, um, and Vivian for presenting that excellent setup for why we're doing it. Um, and just to kind of summarize in just a few sentences, perhaps. So what Recover is doing is it's gathering patient data from across the U.S., studying post-acute sequelae of SARS COVID-19. Uh, uh, infection. And the, the, the issues afflicting our patients have been, you know, inflammatory heart disease, trouble breathing and pulmonary fibrosis, kidney failure, and a wide array of neurological effects, such as uh, difficulty with concentration and brain fog, terrible fatigue syndromes, probably the most disabling of any of these and psychiatric syndromes, including depression and other mental illnesses, which has just been really afflicting our populations to a terrible degree and promises to be perhaps the number one health issue going forward once we come out of this pandemic. I2B2 is being used to index that patient data that flows from the sites in a massive scale. And the patient data is of many different varieties. We have imaging data, we have genomic data, we have IoT data or data from, from devices. We have all kinds of bizarre pathology data with immunoassays, as well as you know, standard straightforward you know, clinical study data that's collected in REDCap or other survey instruments and needs to be you know, essentially pivoted into and make queryable and packageable by I2B2 because ultimately it's the flow of the data getting it all organized through I2B2 Transmart, using the I2B2 Transmart tools that have been developed over many years by teams that are on this call, including um, you know, all those I2B2 teams, the Shrine teams, the Transmart teams, and the Picture teams, and putting that all together so that the data flows from all the different sites and all the different places into an analytic endpoint, we'll call it, right? So we package the data so it can be used for analysis. And it's really the analysis, obviously, that's the important part. And that's what enables our learning healthcare system. This, cost, this, this ability to get data collected, flowing, and to the analysis quickly, accurately, high quality, um, and completely um, is what's gonna enable our learning healthcare system. And that's the, that's the real goal in many ways of I2B2 Transmart and the foundation. So thank you all. And uh, we can take any 